All right, come on, church. Let's give the Lord a big, big, big hand clap of praise this morning. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And, you know, I hope, I hope that you had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving this week. Come on, how many of you had a wonderful, a good Thanksgiving? Absolutely, absolutely. You know what I love about Thanksgiving and, 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 and the holidays is this, that, you know what, we get to get together as family. And see, that's important. It, it really is. And, you know, and there's a reason why everybody's traveling in the holidays. They're traveling because they want to get home. And, uh, you know, I'm actually surprised at how many people we have this morning because, believe it or not, our church is probably 50%, maybe even close to two-thirds of people who are not, not actually from McMinn County. We got a lot of people who are from out of county. And so, but, uh, you know, it is the holidays, Thanksgiving, the holidays. It's a wonderful, wonderful time to be together. It's family time. And, you know, it, it just, this week I was just thinking about this. When I went into the Army back in the late 80s, I was in my, my 20s, and uh, late 20s, by the way, and I was overseas. I got stationed in Berlin, Germany. And, you know, I, in those days you didn't make a whole lot of money when you're in the service. I don't know. Maybe today you still don't. I don't know for sure. But uh, I had to save up all year just to be able to fly back home and to be home for the holidays because you know what? I, I wanted to be home. And, uh, and, and, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing, to be able to be home, to be with family. And you know, and now at this point in my life, being a grandparent and being able to have all the little ones over, what a blessing it is. Come on now. And somebody said, well, what about the kids? Them too, right? So come on, let's thank the Lord for the holidays and for Thanksgiving. Come on, come on. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. All right, okay. Uh, if you want, you can open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. And for those of you, if you're here, if you're new this morning, you're visiting today or you're watching us online, and by the way, let's make them one more time. Let's make our visitors, whether they're here or watching online, let's make them feel welcome and at home. We're doing a... Uh, a, a series in Galatians. Actually, we're going all the way through the book of Galatians. We're doing all six chapters. And uh, this is somewhat of a teaching series, even though Tim corrected me last Sunday and said, that wasn't teaching. That was preaching, okay? So, so here's the deal. It, 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 you know, uh, as we get into this, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna lay any stipulations. I'm gonna try to teach but you know what? If I get fired up, I'm going to preach. Is that okay? I'm going to preach. And this stuff is good. It's worth preaching on, right? So anyway, we're in Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter 3. Today is part 4 in this series. And, uh, you know, uh, part 1 was chapter 1. Part 2 was chapter 2. Last week was chapter 3. And if you remember, for those of you who were here, we didn't even get out of verse 1 really. We were stuck in verse 1. And that's because chapter 3 is just... Man, this is a very, very important uh, chapter in the Bible. And I, and I hope some of you are tracking me. I hope some of you have already did some reading in Galatians. Maybe you've already gone through the book of Galatians. But this particular chapter here, just like I said last uh, Sunday, I said we're not going to get through chapter 3, and I can tell you we're not going to get through it today, okay? Well, we're just not. Now, I, I'm pretty sure we'll get through it next Sunday, okay? Uh, but uh, it's just too much here. We're going to actually be looking at verses 1 through 9. But, but again... You know, as to the importance of Galatians, let me just say this, and I'm going to say it again and again and again. I think that every church, if, 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 you know what, if we name the name of Jesus, we probably should spend at least uh, once a year doing an in-depth study on the book of Galatians because it brings us back into proper focus, okay? Because it's so easy to kind of veer off or kind of get out of balance but Galatians does a great job of getting us refocused and getting us focused in the right direction. So let's do this. Let's go ahead. Let's get into chapter 3 here. And we're starting with verse 1. And Paul the apostle, he says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you or deceived you that you should not obey the truth before who, whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified. Now check this out. Verse 2, he says this, This only. Everybody say only. only. He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Verse 5, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, to you and works miracles among you. How many of you believe in miracles this morning? Come on. And who works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know this, that only, everybody say only again. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Only those who are of faith. The faith here is faith in Jesus. Everybody say faith in Jesus. I want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music this morning. We're talking about faith in Jesus. Paul is talking about faith in Jesus. And he says this again, verse 7, Therefore know only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. How many believers do I have in here this morning? Come on. Hey, hey, how many of you are saved this morning? Come on. Hey, listen, don't be ashamed of it. Listen, this is something you want to shout over. If someone asks the question, if you're saved or if you're born again or if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, this is worth shouting over. The apostle Paul said this. He said, I am not ashamed. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Everybody say gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power. For it, what? What's the it here? The gospel. The good news of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. For it, the preaching of the gospel. And church, it's the gospel of grace. For it, the preaching of the gospel. The gospel of grace is the power of God unto salvation. Come on now. And so getting back to Galatians here, I know a little sidetrack there into Romans. And look at this. I want to read verse 7 again. He says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That means if you are a believer in Christ, if you are saved, if you are born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, guess what? You are sons and daughters of Abraham. Isn't that good news? Come on and see, Paul was dealing with this back in the day because we were actually having some kind of, I, I mean, there were issues going on. There were, you know, we had some jealousy issues going on between the converted Jews and those who were Gentiles and who were Gentiles by faith, faith in Christ Jesus. And so again, he says in verse 7, and I want you to see this because sometimes as Christians, we get into this place of where, well, really, we're, we're, we start to think like we're stepchildren or something like that, that we're really not really part of the family of God. Let me just tell you something right now. If you're born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, you definitely are part of the family of God. And that's good news because he says, verse 7 again, Therefore know that only those who are of faith, which is faith in Christ Jesus, are sons of Abraham. And verse 8 says this, And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying this, and this is important. He says, in you all nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith, faith in Christ Jesus, are blessed with believing Abraham. That's the title of my message this morning. Blessed with believing Abraham. How many of you this morning know that you're blessed with believing Abraham? And the word says that the promises of God are yes and amen. We sang it this morning. And if you're blessed with believing Abraham, you are blessed with the promises of God. And those promises are yes and amen to them that believe. You believe this morning. 
Come on. Yeah, I know. He's preaching again. (laughs) You better believe I am because it's the preaching of the gospel. It's the preaching. Everybody say preaching. It's the preaching of the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. And that's not just getting saved. That's staying saved. Not that I'm insinuating that you can lose your salvation, but here, this is the deal. It's the power of God to salvation, and it's also the power that is the keeping power for salvation. It's what empowers us in our daily walk. (laughs) It's what empowers us in our daily walk. That's why the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of grace has to be hammered over and over and over and over and over again because it's what, it's what brings us alive. I want to leave, I, 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 I want to look at this again. I want to read this last, uh, these last two verses starting with eight. And Paul says this, and the scripture foreseeing that God would, here it is, justify. That means make righteous. That God would justify or make righteous the Gentiles by faith. And again, the emphasis is faith in Christ. Preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying that in you all the nations shall be blessed. All the nations. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now, as we get further into chapter 3 and into chapter 4, Paul's going to get He's going to get into more explanation here on what that in you, Abraham, is all about. And you see, he's going to, he's going to begin to differentiate and, 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 and distinguish between where most of us have looked at this. And Paul will say, you know, the way it's been looked at is that the promises were to the descendants, to the descendants as in plural, to the seed as in plural. But Paul's going to turn this around and say, no, 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 no. You've got the wrong focus. The promise is not to the seed or to the descendants as in plural. The promise is to the seed that is singular. And that seed is the seed of Christ. That seed is the seed of Christ. And so here's what we have to understand. The promises are not so much to us individually, even though they are, but what makes that, what makes that stick, what makes it really applicable is this, that the promises are to Christ. And if the promises are to Christ and we're one with Christ Jesus in the Spirit, then the promises are to us. Yeah. Does that make sense? Come on now, how many of you are one in Christ Jesus this morning? If you've been born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, if you've been saved, come on now. If you've been saved, listen, (laughs) you are one with Christ Jesus. You are one with him in the spirit. And as being one with him in the spirit, you are blessed with believing Abraham. Wow. Now, I want to back up a little bit. I want to back up to verse 2. And I want to look at this because I really wanted to get into this last Sunday, but I didn't get to. Because uh, this really brings some clarification that we as the church, some clarification that we need today, especially if our affiliation or if our background is Pentecostal charismatic. And hey, I'm Pentecostal charismatic. I am all about the Pentecostal experience. I am all about the gifts of the Spirit. Anybody else here? Hey, who's all about the gifts of the Spirit? Hey, therefore today, I'm not a cessationist. We're not cessationists here. What does that mean? That means that we don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit died out with the last of the biblical New Testament apostles. We believe that those things are for today. We believe, you know, when we get into the book of Acts, we read the book of Acts. If it happened in the book of Acts, it happens today. All right? So I'm all about the Pentecostal experience. I am all about the gifts of the Spirit and so forth. But sometimes those of us in the Pentecostal uh, charismatic camp, sometimes we get our semantics a little bit messed up, okay? And so let me, I'm not here, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking this opportunity to, you know, to belittle or to 
put down the Pentecostal charismatic movement in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I'm a part of it. I'm all about it. My salvation experience was a Pentecostal experience. But here's what we got going on. We've got, we got this huge divide that has uh, developed over time, and it's the Pentecostals versus the non-Pentecostals. And that's not a good thing. In fact, right now on my dissertation, one of the main things about my dissertation and what I'm writing is my purpose is to bridge the gap. My purpose is to bridge the gap between Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals and to look at, okay, what do we need to kind of shore up on this side and bring into proper perspective and what do we need to shore up on this side and bring into proper uh, perspective and then we can all meet in the middle. Let me, let, let me just get into this and show you where I'm going. Let's look at this, verse 2. So Paul says this in verse 2, this only, notice I said earlier, I said everybody say only, everybody say only. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Having begun in the Spirit. Now, this is where I'm going. And this is what Paul, this is, this is where he's going in this, and this is what he's focusing on. And this is what I was kind of saying a little bit earlier when I was talking about the divide between Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals. So here you're going to understand what I'm talking about. We're, we're looking at the first part of this verse where he says in verse 2, did you receive the Spirit? Let me ask you something. How many of you here have received the Holy Spirit? Oh, awesome. Well, let me tell you something. Can I, just, can, I, can I just break it to you gently? If you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit. Come on. Now, I know I got some of you looking at me funny, like, you know, like right now. Because I know if you're like me, you got Pentecostal charismatic, you know, affiliation, and you got that in your background. But how many of you heard this phrase before, especially if you were raised or you were brought up or you were affiliated with a Pentecostal charismatic church, you know? So you got everybody that's saved. And then when it comes to, you know, where there's more, everybody say there's more. And there's more. Come on, everybody say there's more. So typically, it'll come across like this. You need the Holy Spirit. Anybody ever experienced that? Anybody ever been in that situation? Come on. I know you got saved, brother, but you need the Holy Spirit. Can I just, again, let me bring some clarification here. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, and that's what Paul is addressing right here. Having begun in the Spirit. And so the way that he's checking their salvation, the, the, the way that he's dealing with this issue in Galatia, with the churches in Galatia, he's not doing it by basic and on whether they're keeping the law or not. He's not saying, hey, listen, have you kept the Ten Commandments? He's not doing that. He's not even saying, look at the fruit of keeping the commandments. His question is this, did you receive the Spirit? So what Paul is saying this, when it comes to salvation, the evidence of our salvation is this and only this in the sense of the way that we look at what it means to be saved. And that is this, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And I can tell you right now, if you're sitting here this morning, if you claim to be saved, you claim to be born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, if you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and it was a genuine, genuine experience, it was a genuine, genuine salvation experience, guess what? You received the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, you couldn't have gotten saved without the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul, again in verse 3, will say, having begun in the Spirit. And so getting back to this, what I was talking about earlier about the divide between Pentecostal charismatics and non-Pentecostals and e evangelicals, what we do in the Pentecostal camp is that we typically make this huge distinction between what it means to be saved and what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. And I get it. And you know why we do that? Because our main book of emphasis is the book of Acts. Hey, I'm all about the book of Acts. What did I say earlier? If it's in the book of Acts, we do it. We believe it. We practice it. 
Come on, can I get an amen this morning? <laughs> in fact, in 2024, on Wednesday nights, we're going to do an in-depth study on the book of Acts. Okay? So we're going to look at what that's all about. And so that's typically what we as Pentecostals do. Our go-to book in the Bible is the book of Acts. But in the non-Pentecostal camp, typically speaking, their go-to books for expressing their theology, and notice I said books. Their go-to books are the Pauline epistles. So they go to the Pauline epistles. And if you're reading in the Pauline epistles, you know, and if, you've, are, 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 if you're schooled in the Pauline epistles, you're going to see that there can be some drastic differences between the way Paul articulates things and the way that Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, articulates things. And so here's how, how, how do you reconcile that, Pastor? How do you reconcile the differences or the, you know, uh, the things that sometimes we use to divide? Well, when it comes to the book of Acts, the writer, the author of the book of Acts is Luke. In fact, you probably didn't know this. The book of Acts is just, in a sense, that's just part two to the gospel of Luke. Did you know that? That's why typically the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is called Luke-Acts. Luke is the writer of both, and they both literally are written as, as, as part one and part two. Now, here's the thing about Luke. Luke's emphasis in writing, especially when it comes to the book of Acts, Luke put the main emphasis on the charismatic aspects and elements of the working of the Holy Spirit. So when Luke writes... Luke is going to write about the things that you could experience, that you could see, that you could, you know, the subjective elements of being born again or saved or the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So Luke is going to highlight things like speaking in tongues, prophecy, visions and dreams, the miraculous and so forth. Are you with me? All right. Now, but when we go to the New Testament epistles, specifically Paul, Paul doesn't so much put emphasis on that other than 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, a little bit in, in, in Ephesus. But the big difference is where Luke writes in the narrative and gives us historical information, Paul writes in the didactic. You're like, oh, he's got his PhD jacket on. <laughs> There's a big difference. So in Luke's writings, especially as it relates to the book of Acts, he's writing in the narrative. He's giving us an, a, a historical account of what happened with and in the early church. And he's using a lot of, you know, he's giving us examples in the sense of the working of the Holy Spirit, the outward working of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit such as tongues and prophecy and visions and dreams and the miraculous. But Paul, on the other hand, when I use that word didactic, that's teaching. The Pauline epistles were written to instruct the church on doctrine. In other words, they were written to help the church understand what they believe. Luke's writings, that's not the case with Luke's writings. Luke is giving you the history of what happened. Paul is explaining to these churches that experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Paul is explaining to them what this is all about. In other words, Luke was into the charismatic. That's where we get Pentecostal charismatics. How many charismatics I have in here? Come on now. Luke was into the charismatic. Paul was into the ontological aspects of the working of the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? Pastor, you're getting deep this morning. In other words, for the most part, when Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit, he's talking about essence. He's talking about existence. He's talking about being. Everybody say being. So with Paul, that's why you're going to read statements like, Christ in you, the hope of glory, or hey, it's Christ in me. Hey, or hey, how about this? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, when Paul says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a, 
He is a new creation. He is a new creation. And church, that's not just a metaphor. There's reality there. He says, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, not some things, all things have become new. So when you get saved, you become a new creation. But you can't become a new creation on your own. You didn't make yourself a new creation. There's not enough doing that you can do to make yourself a new creation. This is where grace comes in the picture. Everybody say grace. grace. And so when we got saved, God did a work in us that made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we literally, spiritually speaking, became one with Christ Jesus in the Spirit. And so I'm going to give you something to rejoice over. And that being the case, as the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 4, as he is, so are we in the world. Not when we get to heaven. It says, so are we in this world. As he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. So here's the deal. If Jesus is righteous, we're righteous. Not based on the works of the law. Paul's talking about being in our state of existence. He's coming from an ontological perspective. Luke is focusing on the charismatic elements of the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul's focusing on our, literally our being because guess what? It's actually most important that we know who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. Come on, that's like last week. Come on, last week I said this. How many of you can agree that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Yes. See, that's ontological. Say this, I am, I am. The, righteousness, the righteousness, the righteousness of God righteousness. in Christ Jesus. I am, I am. The, righteousness the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. That's not just some nice little saying. That's who you are because you've been born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, so what I'm going to say is getting back to what I was saying earlier. Sometimes we in the Pentecostal charismatic camp, we tend to devalue salvation to exalt the charismatic elements of the working of the Holy Spirit. And that is wrong because the foundation is salvation. The, the, the foundational elements of who we are and, and what we are, it's salvation. And what we tend to do on our side of the tracks is to devalue salvation. And church, we should never, ever, 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 ever do that. But on the other side of the tracks, the non-Pentecostal side, what they tend to do as far as, because you're like, are you going to pick on them, Pastor? Here's, here's what they tend. They tend to reject the book of Acts. That's where that whole cessationist movement comes from, that the gifts aren't for today. And you know, it's mind-boggling to me, number one, that you cannot prove, biblically speaking, exegetically, hermeneutically, charismatically, that the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. And if that's not convincing enough, let me ask you something. How many of you here have experienced some aspect of the charismatic gifts working in your life? Look at that. So how can a person with an argument go to a person who's had an experience and think they can win that argument? Basically, all they can do is say, you're a... I almost said something bad. It has been the holidays. I mean, so they don't have an argument. But the argument they do have is that when they emphasize the Pauline epistles and when Paul's writing about the Holy Spirit, especially as it pertains to creation and who we are in Christ, they have a great argument. We just need to meet in the middle. But here's what I'm talking about. I want you to see this. Let's go to Romans real quick if you can hang with me a little bit. 
And we're in Romans chapter 8. Again, one of those, I mean, you're talking about important chapters in the Bible. Starting with verse 8, Paul says this, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And if we just stop there, our minds can go all over the place on what Paul is saying. When he says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And how many times have I heard it from the pulpits of where, now you get in the flesh, you can't be pleasing to God. You you're with me so far? Yeah. But let's look at the context here and what Paul is really saying. Check this out. Again, verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But church, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. You are not in the flesh. You may have carnal moments. You may at times kind of, you know, slip and slide and, and even, I mean, <laughs> using an expression, you're split hell wide open. But as a born-again believer, you're still in the spirit. Let's read it again. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And verse 10 says this, and if Christ is in you, there it is. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The body is dead because of sin. Everybody pinch yourself. If you pinch hard enough, it hurts, right? Because this stuff is, it's decaying. And I listen, and, you know, we can put a lot of things into practice. We can speak life to our bodies, and I believe in that. I believe that we can, you know, that we can, you know, as it says in Psalm 91, that we can live a long life satisfied and that we don't have to be bound by sin. We don't have to fall prey to sin in the sense of the way that it brings sickness and disease and this and that. I'm all about that. But uh, unfortunately, eventually, we're going to go the way of everyone else. There is a day coming that these physical bodies are going to yield to what they're attached to, and that's this world. But here's the good news, church. My spirit is not attached to this world anymore. I've got a born-again spirit. I have received the Holy Spirit, and that is literally the essence of who I am. And so I don't look at my physical being, especially the first thing I get up in the morning. I, like I said last week, I don't look at the mirror to see how good I look. I try to, just like most of you ladies, I try to avoid it. Because what I see in the mirror is not who I am. What you see in the mirror is not who you are. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, created in his likeness and image. Come on. Your born-again spirit is the new creation, is the new image, which agrees with God's true likeness and image. And here's the deal. If you have received the Holy Spirit, which Paul will go back and forth. Again, we, we tend to divide over semantics. Paul, in the same phrase, will say the Holy Spirit and then say the Spirit of Christ and not make a distinction. Do you see what I'm talking about? So if you got saved, that means you received the Holy Spirit. And if you received the Holy Spirit, that means you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you. And that Spirit of Christ doesn't just dwell in you. It empowers you. It empowers you to live the life. That's our life source. And so what Paul is saying here, you know, let's go back to Galatians and let's start with verse 5 again, if you, if you don't mind. He says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, by keeping the law, or by the hearing of faith? Hey, come on. You know, faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and more hearing and more hearing. Come on now. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. What Word? The Word of faith. And guess what the word of faith is? You know what the early church fathers would say? You know how they would take that expression, the word of faith? You know what they said that the word of faith was? The word of righteousness. 
by hearing and hearing and hearing and more hearing about who you are in Christ. Because we have to be reminded on a daily basis because this world is bent. This world is fixed to make us doubt who we are. And it works that way. The, the devil works that way. Sadly speaking, the church does the same thing. And that's why right now, church, God's doing a work in me. And that's why I'm not relenting. I'm not backing down. I'm not giving in. I don't care what people say. You can call me a grace preacher. You can say I'm preaching too much grace. I don't care. I don't care. Because I know what the truth is. I got the word of God to back it up. And like Paul said, if they're saying those kind of things, let them be accursed. And he says, verse 5 again, Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How many believers do I have in here this morning? See, so got both hands. Some people got both hands up. Hey, you get a double blessing because of that because you just showed your faith. You just stepped out of the crowd. You weren't embarrassed. You lifted both hands. That means you are blessed with believing Abraham, which also means, guess what? God has imputed to you, not by the works of the law or keeping the law, but by faith, he has imputed to you his righteousness. He has declared you to be righteous, not based on what you are doing in the flesh. Not that he condones when we get stupid. Oh, now he's starting to go somewhere. No, I'm not. <laughs> I can say you're stupid a hundred times and it won't change you. The only thing that will change you is the hearing by the hearing by the hearing and hearing by the word, the word of faith, the word of righteousness of who you are in Christ Jesus. And then he says, verse 7, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the good news, the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, And you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So this is where I really want to kind of bring things to a close here because I know that probably with the things I've shared this morning have created some questions. And I, just, and I don't want to miss it. I want to read it right here because we're going, to ask, we're going to answer these questions this morning or this question. So how do you know? So how do you know that you have received the Holy Spirit, which is, church, the promise of the Father, which is the evidence of salvation and righteousness, which is the evidence of faith working in you, which is the evidence of being blessed with believing Abraham? I know that's a whole lot to chew on. I bet I can do it without reading it. So how do you know that you have the Holy Spirit or that you have received the Holy Spirit, which is the evidence of having received the promise of the Father, which is the evidence of, of being saved and declared righteous, which is the evidence that you've got faith, God's kind of faith, not just the kind of faith where you just believe, but hey, you got the faith of the Son of God working in you. Tim, you're going to love that because that's King James. See, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, here's the King James, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. I live by the faith. Everybody say the faith. The faith, the faith which God himself by his grace Amen. sowed into me. So again, so how do you know, church? How do you know this morning that you have received the Holy Spirit, which is the promise of the Father, which is the evidence of salvation and righteousness, which is the evidence of faith working in you, which is the evidence of being blessed with believing Abraham? Here it is, number one, the new creation or the new birth. If you have been born again, saved, you are a new creation. Come on. How many of you here are born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus? That's evidence number one. Let's give some scripture. Again, let's read it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how many of you are in Christ this morning? He is a new creation. Focus on the new creation of who you are in Christ, not on your old self or, you know, your inability to measure up. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In other words, the way that you used to relate to God has now changed. Now you relate to God differently. You see God differently. See, I remember there was a day I was raised in church all my life, but I was literally oblivious to God. God was not in my thinking and my reasoning. And, you know, but when I got saved, when I got born again, a new creation, then my whole perspective and my whole way of thinking changed. Look at what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, and that born of water is not water baptism, by the way. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot or she cannot enter the kingdom of God. Hey, church, real quick, what's the kingdom of God? Righteous. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? What's the kingdom of God? Righteousness. Righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you've been born again, there's some aspect of you that should be in, uh, literally embracing this whole beautiful thing about righteousness, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you should have peace, and you should have joy. But here's the deal. The devil works hard to, <laughs> to cause you to doubt those things. And the church at times, sadly speaking, has leagued up with the devil to rob us of our righteousness and our peace and our joy, putting the emphasis on keeping the law and doing the works of the law. Because if you're going to focus on that, I promise you, you're not going to be righteous and you're not going to have that peace of God that surpasses all understanding and you're not going to have the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. Man, when you really understand this and get this stuff, Hey, and I'm talking to worship team too. You won't look like you swallowed a pickle sideways and that you're the saddest person in the world. When you get this, your worship will change from sackcloth and ashes to joy, to joy, to joy, to joy. Because, hey, it's no longer sackcloth and ashes. Man, we are the bride of Christ and it don't get any better than that. Most assuredly, again, Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The New English translation says born from above. And actually, the right Greek word means above. Do not marvel. I got to get my breath. I am out of shape. It's all that Thanksgiving. Sandra, thanks a lot. <clears throat> he says, do not marvel that I, that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. Let me ask you something. How many here have been born of the Spirit? Me. You. Born of the Spirit. Your salvation is the result of being born of the Spirit. And that's why, again, that's another reason why we shout, another reason why we praise, another reason why we can be, we can have a celebration. Hey. Oh, I better not. Hey, let's look at how Paul will articulate what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. Let's look at Titus chapter 3. Look at this. You're going to almost see the same thing said but expressed in a little bit different way. He says, when the anger and the judgment of God our Savior toward man appeared. Ain't nobody going to correct me? Kindness. <laughs> Come on. Does it say when the anger and the judgment of God appeared? 
when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by keeping the law or by the works of righteousness, which he says we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Here it is. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified or declared righteous by his what? Grace. Grace, We should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Look how Paul articulates the receiving of the Holy Spirit. He uses the same metaphor that Luke does in the book of Acts, having poured out. Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10, Luke will word it this way. These that have received the Holy Spirit, God has poured out His Spirit. But yet Paul here is talking about salvation and using the same Greek phrase, whom God poured out by His Spirit. Salvation was poured out on us. That's metaphorically speaking. But the bottom line is it worked like this. When you got saved, you need to praise Jesus because at that moment, God poured out his spirit upon you and upon us, empowering us to be witnesses for Jesus. Amen. Those are just a few things to back up. Statement number one, which is this. How do you know? Number one, the new creation or the new birth. If you have been born again, saved, you are a new creation. How about number two? This is really good. Check this out. Number two is this. How do you know that you have received the Holy Spirit? It's this. You know who Christ is in the Spirit, church. In other words, you know that you know that you know. And nothing can change your mind or persuade you. Hey, look at that closely. How do you know you've been Saved. How do you know you've received the Holy Spirit? How do you know that faith is working in you? You know because of this. You know because you know Christ. You know Christ intimately and you know him personally. And that you know that you know that you know and no one, no devil in hell can ultimately persuade you to see things differently. That's part of the new creation. Come on now. You know that you know. Come on, church. You see, now, if you're kind of struggling with this, maybe it's because, again, maybe you've been sitting under the wrong kind of preaching. The kind of preaching that makes you doubt. One of the best examples we have of this is in Matthew chapter 16. Do you remember when Jesus came to his disciples and he said to them, he said this, he said, and I'm saying this to you right now. Who do men say that I am? You see, we shouldn't be sitting here trying to figure that one out. Who do we say Jesus is? I hope you're not sitting there trying to figure that out. I hope you're still not trying to reason that out. Because you ought to know that you know that you know. How many know that they know that they know? So what did the disciples say back to him? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist coming back from the dead. Some say that you're Elijah who's come back in a whirlwind. Some say, hey, 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 hey you, you know, you're one of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus asked them again and say, but who do you say that I am? And see, I think Jesus is asking that question to the church right now. Church, who do you say that I am? See, today, what's going on in the church? And again, it's evidence that, hey, we don't have a lot of people who say they're saved, saved. Uh-oh. Because we got people claiming to be Christians who are saying, well, you know, Jesus is cool. We're buds. We're good. We're good. We're good. But so is Muhammad, and so is Buddha, and so is Krishna, and so is... Who do you say I am? Look at, what, look at how Peter responded. Verse 16 says this in Matthew 16. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not, here it is, revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's grace. 
And I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, salvation is built on this, not Peter being the first apostle or being the first stone in the church or the first pope. Sorry. You know, I thank God for my Catholic upbringing, but that's not what this says. What, what Jesus was saying to Peter is this. I'm, the rock that I'm going to build my church on is the rock of revelation knowledge of who I am. And that revelation knowledge is the revelation knowledge that was given by my Father to you. And when you have the rock of revelation knowledge, you're not going to sit here and go, well, is it Muhammad? Is it Buddha? Is it, I don't know. I'm good with all of them. You're going to know that you know that you know that Jesus Amen. is the Son of God and that he is the Savior of the world. Come on. That's right. Come on. There ain't no devil in hell. There's nobody that can tell me differently. And if you're struggling in these two things that I've just mentioned, either one, you probably need to examine whether you're saved or not, or two, maybe you've sit under a lot of bad teaching that's really kind of, you know, yeah, warped your thinking. And see, more seeds of doubt and unbelief were planted in you than seeds of faith. You know, and I'm not trying to be critical here, but another area in which we've messed up as Christians is, and don't get me wrong, I get it, I get it, I get it. But, you know, a lot of the way that we practice getting saved, sometimes I think we need to reevaluate that. I ain't got time to get into all that this morning, but not every little Johnny that went to the altar when they were going through that week of summer vacation Bible school, I promise you, little Johnny didn't get saved. Little Johnny accepted heaven over hell, but there was not a true born-again experience. Right? It's not about choosing heaven over hell. God's not after a harem. That's, that's Islam. You can have 60 brides and you can put them all in chains if you want. And they're going to stay married to you because you have the power to beat them if you want to. Right? Do you know the church has kind of taught that too? when we use fear tactics to drive someone to Jesus? Jesus is not looking for a slave. He's not looking for, you know, he, he, this is not about a shotgun wedding. This is about a beautiful wedding. Jesus loves his bride. And he's here to love on her. He's here to lavish her. He's here to bestow gifts upon her. He's here to go into the secret place so that we can enjoy some good secret place intimacy. And it's in that secret place that he'll whisper so softly and he'll show us things that eye has not seen and ear has not heard and neither has entered into the heart of man the things that he has in store for us. I see a bunch of smiles on your faces. Here, here's how Paul would phrase it. Romans 4, verses 20 through 22. He, Abraham, did not waver at the promise. Anybody wavering this morning? Of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced. Everybody say fully convinced. Or fully persuaded that what he promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I know that especially depending on what our background is, whether it's Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, or whatever, we tend to take these verses and focus on the promises as a whole. And that's good. I've got no problem with that. But the context that Paul is talking about here in chapters 3, 4, and 5, 6, 7, and 8 is righteousness, is salvation. So here's the deal. So what's the evidence that you've been saved? What's the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit? is that you're fully convinced. Anybody fully convinced? Yeah. Come on, that's what I was talking about. You know that you know that you know. You may not really understand the Scripture that well, and I get it. 
because we got so much teaching today. My Lord, Facebook is littered. Everybody's got a PhD. Everybody is an expert on the Word of God on Facebook. And no wonder we're all over the place on what we believe. And no wonder we're wavering and all that other stuff. But getting through all of the smoke, you know that you know. Check your knower. Check your knower. You know. And if you don't, then yes, maybe you need to examine your heart and you need to look at your walk and where you're at and I'm not saying don't gauge it by whether you're keeping the commandments or not then the devil will get you right back into that tailspin and you'll crash and burn but do you know now let's add to that one last thing is that okay can I do one more so again how do you know that you have received the Holy Spirit which is the promise of the Father that Jesus mentions in Acts chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 24 and in the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, which is the evidence of salvation and righteousness, which is the evidence of faith literally working in you because we're saved by grace, right? Ephesians 2, 8, we're saved by grace through what? Not of what? There you go. Y'all ought to be posting on Facebook. We'll get some people truly saved. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, not of works. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, not of works. But how do we know? How do we know? I'm giving you a third one. There's more, but this is the one I'm going to focus on right here. It's this. How do you know? Because the love of God has been poured out in your heart. In other words, not only have you experienced the love of God, you love Jesus. Because the love of God, by God's grace, by his tender mercies, mercies, by his goodness and his kindness, he poured out. See, he did this for us, that he poured out his love upon us. He lavished us with his love. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 as I wrap this up. Paul says this in verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint Because the love of God has been, here's that expression, poured out in our hearts by receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that's kind of probably out of the three I've given this morning, that's probably the most subjective. I get it. And if you really are struggling with loving Jesus, either there's two things going on here. Either one, you've really not sent, you've not, you've not been sitting under good preaching and teaching that has been bringing forth the love of God and articulating and expressing the love of God, the love of the Father. You might have been in a church that preached judgment, 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 judgment. I know, I've been there. I got saved on the love of God and then I went through several years of being indoctrinated into the judgment and anger of God. Can anybody testify? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And yeah, it started to just literally rob me of that. My love for God began to literally just, just shrink away. Why? Because The Apostle John says we love him because he first loved us. If we're not sitting under the preaching of the love of God, our love for God is going to wane. It's literally just, it's going to begin to, you know, if you don't water the flower, it's going to dry up. How is the flower watered? By the preaching of the goodness of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Let me get you to stand.